I decided to call today's homily, What is the Opposite of Hope? The text I've chosen for today's reading is from Romans, where the author speaks eloquently about hope. This is Romans 5, verses 1 to 5, the New Revised Standard Version. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Hope is such an easy word to say, but such a hard one to practice. Yet many dreamers and poets speak of this sometimes elusive and flighty virtue. Emily Dickinson said this of it, Hope is a thing with feathers that perches on the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. She, the hermit poet, saw hope as always present actually perching in the soul, evidently then always accessible. One of my own favorite poets is Mary Oliver, who gets her inspirations from the natural world, as seen by her poem, I Worried. I worried a lot. Will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And if not, how shall I correct it? Was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Will I ever be able to sing? Even the sparrows can do it and I'm, well, hopeless. Is my eyesight fading or am I just imagining it? Am I going to get rheumatism, lockjaw, dementia? Finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing and I gave it up and took my old body and went out into the morning and sang. She raises some important issues, such as rivers flowing in the right direction, the earth maybe not being able to turn as it was taught. Yet instead of worrying, which actually means shaking something to death, like a prey or a toy rabbit, she puts all of it aside and just knows that she needs to go out into the early morning to sing. I must also include a prophet, a poet, a preacher in this list, Martin Luther King. My favorite quote from him is, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. MLK fought long and hard to bend this arc as much as he could in his own lifetime. He even wrote about it in a letter from Birmingham jail, especially targeting other clergy from hiding for the right for racial justice. Who knows why? Maybe just to keep their jobs. Maybe to continue to be supported by their white segregated congregants who firmly believed that segregation was God's will. Maybe for some of them who knew it was wrong, fear of their own lives and reputations as well kept them away. Who knows what he would have accomplished if he had lived a long life. No one will know because he was murdered by a sniper in Dallas so others have had to carry on with his dream and make it their own. I've participated in my share of protests in my very long lifetime. In the Vietnam War, my male classmates at UCSB were sending, being sent to their draft boards to be enlisted in this endless census and ultimately failed war. We had students all wore black armaments to class and took turns in the public square of the campus reading the names of the American war dead from a microphone from the long and continually growing list of American soldiers who'd been killed there. Years later, my husband and I, with one child in a backpack, another holding her dad's hand, walked in a large group from Mission Santa Barbara down to the harbor to protest the war. I also participated in a three-day fast along with others to protest this monstrous killing machine, clothes in sheep's clothing. Years later, when I came out, I walked from Eugene to Portland, a 150-mile, two-week walk to protest the laws restricting the rights of the gay community, 
We later added lesbian, bisexual, trans, but then we were just gay and uniformly lumped together and demonized. We were truly honored to lead, honored to lead the gay pride parade right after the Dykes on Bikes. When I joined with my spouse in Berkeley to live, where she was in seminary, we both went to the protest at the nearby Livermore nuclear facility. We stood with others along with an elderly nun in full habit with a walker. When the last call came to disperse, we left. I chose not to be arrested. After all, I had to preach the Easter service two days later, didn't I? Wasn't that more important? And yet as I turned away, I noticed the elderly nun was hobbling closer to the police to be taken to the station and booked. Looking back now, I think I maybe made the wrong decision. At another protest by our seminary, a group of us, mostly clergy in full clerical regalia, had a sit-in at the main intersection in San Francisco. Yet again, the clergy and seminarians had already agreed to be arrested, were arrested peacefully. Sadly, but with a great sense of pride, I watched them being herded into the waiting buses. Vietnam War finally ended. The draft ended, for now. We have tucked the American dead safely into names engraved on the memorial wall in Washington, D.C., right next to the memorial for the Korean War. We've even ended the decades-long fruitless war in Afghanistan and Iraq and still await more memorial statues for those who are dead. There have been many advances in integration. We have the official end of segregation in 1965, but there are many, many arrests, convictions, and outright murders of black people and other racial minorities, and racism still prevails, mostly unrecognized and unchallenged. There have also been strides in the LGBT culture wars. Cheryl and I have been legally married since 2008, but trans people are still being denied medical care, rights to bathroom support. Many school districts have forbidden many controversial books and any mention of LGBT issues. There are murders of trans community very frequently. Some states have proposed legislation to take away our marriages. And the one thing I have not mentioned, please look at this chart. You can see that 2022 is very, very high, yet it's not even half over, and it will be able to surpass by far the previous year. Wow, cool. Can you guess what it is? I will count to 10 while you ponder. It refers to mass shootings this year. 27 so far taking place in schools. Knee-jerk responses are, say together with me, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. I for one am getting tired of thoughts and prayers. Words without any action are totally useless, cowardly, and sensitive. Some days I've got to the point where I no longer react and frequently ask my spouse as she gets up, how many mass shootings have occurred since I went to bed? It's sort of like fantasy football or horse racing. It is led from all its passion, its anger, its indignity, its full incarnation. It's just statistics. No longer generates any fear, much less hope that things will change. It is just inevitable. So we sit down to breakfast, pour the milk, as we ponder the coming day. Just as I was finishing this homily, I learned of yet another one in Smithsburg, Maryland, at a school. The opposite of hope is not fear or despair, but just that, apathy. We no longer react. We've become absolutely numb. Here, take a look at and read this comic as Cheryl pauses this for that. This came out today in a weekly small town newspaper, a liberal newspaper in a very conservative town. It is so true, I expect scenarios like this are being played over and over across the country as these senseless and horrific acts multiply and intensify and check. Yet there is actually something even worse which is beginning to happen. We lose our outrage, our horror, and simply become conditioned to the new reality. Mm -hmm. Just take another cup of coffee, tell the kid to go play in their room, and switch the channel. We are just worn out, so we become 
apathetic, or to use another word, slothful. The Catholic Church lists sloth, or apathy if you will, along with the six other deadly sins of pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, and sloth as the last one, or actually, I think, maybe the first in importance. When we hear the word sloth, we are more likely to think of the arboreal animal with long arms who moves very slowly, as we might in a slothful manner. But this is just as serious as the better known ones like lust and pride and envy. Say the first sex takes some energy. Anyone who has been truly angry can feel their blood pressure rise, their jaws and muscles of their fist probably clenched. They are likely like wound springs ready to explode at the least trigger. Not so with sloth. That's why it's so deadly and dangerous. It's way beyond the nap level. It means that we have literally exhausted all of our resources, given up even the little bit of hope we might have left. I just want to lie down and die, not literally perhaps, but to anything but our own needy selves. We literally have no energy, good or bad, for anything else. The question now becomes, what can we do with sloth, if anything? Do we just wait it out? Do we label hope a stupid fantasy that cannot exist in the real world? Back to Charlie Schultz and Peanuts for a glimmer of an answer. I also saw a Peanuts cartoon this morning. Charlie Brown went out onto the ice to skate, but he kept slipping, finally ending up on his backside. Snoopy ventured out onto the ice and didn't try to help him up, but just lay down with his head on Charlie's stomach. That is a vision of God that seems pretty believable. But I couldn't find it, so I substituted the one below. Here they are together, companionably sitting side by side as they look into the distance. I love the ambiguity of the sky here. We literally do not know if the sun is rising or setting. This is what happens when we need to keep the flames of hope alive for so long and do not have a certain date or a destination fixed or a roadmap to help us get there. We don't really know if it's getting worse or better, if it's getting darker or the light is about to come. If you, like me, are subject to sloth, just admit it. Remember, however, that you are not alone. You do not have to bear the weight of the whole world on your shoulders and in your heart. It reminds me of this when I see a flock of geese flying in formation overhead. There's one head goose who will take all of the wind resistance with their outspread wings, but cut it down for the many following him or her. When it becomes tired, it just drops out of the formation and goes to the end of the formation as long as it takes to regain its strength. Remember Snoopy. Remember the lead goose. Remember when you can, when you need to, and when you are ready, it might be your turn to be the lead goose. You will know when. Remember you are not alone. Find companions, even if it's only to sit with you in the silence and questioning. I'm going to end this rather depressing homily with something nonsensical. If the two you see on this clip can learn to dance together and have a moment of joy, no matter how short it is, you too can even for a moment, and know somewhere your soul is still alive. As Emily Dickinson said, hope is a thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Yes, 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 yes.